All righty. Good afternoon, uh, and welcome to day two of the 2013 State of the Net Conference. My name is Alan Davidson, and I am a visiting scholar at MIT, uh, but my real claim to fame this afternoon is as a member of the board of the Internet Education Foundation and the Internet Caucus Advisory Committee, today's organizers. Uh, I've been asked to say a few words to introduce the program this afternoon, um, and I want to start with a, a few quick words about the Internet Caucus Advisory Committee. Supreme Court Justice Louis Brandeis, see this is what happens unfortunately when you become an academic. Um, <laughs> Justice Brandeis, in a uh, very famous opinion about the right uh, to privacy, offered these words. The greatest dangers to liberty, wrote Brandeis, lurk in the insidious encroachment by men of zeal, well-meaning but without understanding. Those words ring true as policymakers continue to celebrate and to struggle with uh, the technological changes that are facing our society today. And for over 15 years, the Internet Caucus has stood as a guiding light in promoting understanding in the face of well-meaning, but sometimes uh, misunderstanding encroachments by regulators. For 15 years, there's no organization that has done more to inform members of Congress and their staff about the really complicated issues that face us on the Internet. Uh, so today we are here to, in part, offer our thanks and congratulations to the Internet Caucus co-chairs, uh, to Jerry Berman and Tim Lorden, who have uh, built this organization, and, uh, uh, and to really uh, say thank you as we continue for the great work that's been done as we continue to confront the role of the Internet in, uh, in our lives. Today's program uh, focuses on the Internet's role in promoting economic growth. This second day, for those who are State of the Net regulars, uh, the second day is uh, a bit of an experiment, and it reflects the recognition that the Internet is transforming the global economy. Researchers are starting to document the Internet's power to generate jobs, to fuel economic prosperity, to improve the way we deliver critical services in our economy. Um, the Internet technology sector is thriving and growing at rates nearly double that of healthcare, manufacturing, farming, uh, and it's producing some of the best paying jobs in our economy. I would offer two brief observations. Uh, first, the internet and information technology is now a central part of our economy. Uh, the Mc McKinsey Global Institute just recently uh, released a study that talked about how over the last five years, 21% of GDP growth in modern economies is attributable to the Internet. Uh, Engine Advocacy recently released a study showing that since early 2004, economic growth in the high-tech sector has outpaced growth in the private sector as a whole by a ratio of three to one. Uh, and the role of the Internet and IT in promoting growth is not confined to a few companies or a few places in our country. And I'll say this, when I first opened Google's office in Washington, I was advised by people who know politics that uh, the internet companies could never hope to compete with more established sectors, at least politically, right? I was told, you know, telcos have employees in every district. Cable companies are in every district. There is a television station in every district. Uh, big tech and media companies have employees uh, all over the country. Internet companies can't pe compete with that. There are just a few internet districts. Today, uh, I think we know that every district is an internet district. Every state is an, has an economy that's impacted by the internet and the role of technology. Every district has eBay sellers who make a living online, small businesses who use Amazon as a platform, app developers who rely on Facebook and Apple for a living, advertisers finding customers anywhere in the, anywhere in the world, on Google, on Twitter, on Yahoo. Um, our country is now an internet country. And as we will hear from today's speakers, there is a tremendous opportunity for economic growth as we embrace this ongoing revolution. Uh, the second thing I would just say is that we have a lot of work to do to promote the conditions for continued growth and leadership. It is not a coincidence that many of the leading internet companies in the world have been born in America. It is a product of our educational system, our economic culture, our economic environment, and I would say a policy and legal system that has been friendly to internet innovation. As other countries consider deeper regulation of the internet, we need to remind them 
that internet freedom is the best way to realize economic opportunity online. But our work continues first here at home. How can we help the internet be a platform for economic growth? How can policymakers enhance the capital needed for the internet to achieve its potential? We have an all-star lineup with us this afternoon uh, today to help us answer these questions. And I'm looking for a, a quick signal from the back to see if our keynote speaker is here or whether we're going to dive into the next panel. Was that this or was that <laughs> this? <laughs> or was that something in between? Was that this? This is, that was one minute. We, if only we had like, couldn't, shouldn't we be tweeting or something, Tim? Okay, one minute. Well, um, in a moment, we're gonna hear from uh, this uh, panel here, and I'm gonna take a moment to introduce uh, Joe Waz, who is going to be leading the first segment of our panel this afternoon while we are waiting. And I should say our congressional keynote speaker was delayed by votes, but then has magically appeared. So uh, I think we'll be joined in just a moment. Um, but first, to, to lead off our, the first part, first half of our segment uh, this afternoon um, is somebody who actually doesn't need a lot of introduction in this crowd. Uh, Joe Waz is the Senior Strategic Advisor uh, for Comcast uh, Corporation, and um, he has really been the architect and leader of much of Comcast's public policy work for some time now. Uh, we'll just leave it at that, some time now. Here in, here in Washington. Uh, he's based, uh, uh, he resides in Los Angeles and in Washington, D.C., I guess can be more accurately described as a former SVP and head of public policy at Com Comcast, uh, and he's recently returned to the company as a senior strategic advisor. And he will introduce the rest of our panel. And in a moment, uh, I'll introduce our, in one moment, we'll have our, <laughs> our keynote. Um, the other thing I was going to say, by the way, is I, I, uh, uh, we were talking about, I was mentioning the fact that uh, there's a tie-in between the two, pro, two halves of this day, uh, of this conference, rather. Yesterday, we really spent, uh, had something that was much more like the traditional state of the net conference. We talked about the kind of issues of internet freedom, privacy, uh, um, the kind of copyright IP policy issues that tend to uh, dominate our discussions. This, I think, is a, it's an experiment, but they're linked. It's an attempt to set, say, we need to elevate the conversation about the internet and to realize that it's not just about uh, these these moment-to-moment -moment policy issues that so many of us think about, but the fact that now we're playing on a larger field. And the fact is that the internet has a very broad impact on our economy, uh, bigger than it has uh, ever before. And when we think about these issues, we need to think about them not just because of their impact on the companies and com consumers who use the internet, but on, uh, on our broader economy. So with that, let me say a few more, just uh, it's, it's gonna be my pleasure to introduce our, our congressional keynote this afternoon. For many of the, us in this audience, uh, Congressman Steve Scalise is not somebody who needs an introduction. He's been a representative of the first district of Louisiana. He has um, uh, been a member of the House Energy and Commerce Committee. He's a senior member of the Technology and Sub, uh, Communication Subcommittee there, and he's been a leading thinker on energy issues. And I should say he also has a bachelor's degree in computer programming from LSU, which is a serious claim to fame in this crowd, I think. Uh, he's the new chairman of the Republican Study Committee, congratulations, and uh, which, as many of you know, is the largest organization in the House Republican majority. And uh, as such, I think he's gonna have um, a very influential role uh, in the budgetary and fiscal debate that's facing our country this year. So please join me in welcoming Congressman Steve Scalise. I appreciate the invitation and uh, I think we're running a little late. We just finished a vote on the House floor, so uh, you'll probably read about that. Um, but I, uh, I just want to first thank all of you for uh, not only for participating and, and doing the things that you do uh, to fight for internet freedom, but uh, for inviting me to talk to you today about uh, some of the things that we're dealing with in Congress. Um, 
and uh, I think it was mentioned, my degree is in computer science. I actually worked, you know, I had a real job in the private sector for a long time, worked uh, programming computers for about 15 years and designing computer systems. Uh, so this is near and dear to my heart uh, and, you know, being able to, to work in the technology industry but also uh, see uh, the, the creation, kind of the, the growth of the Internet through the years and what it's done to our economy. Uh, is something that I feel very strongly uh, we need to protect. And so what I want to talk to you today uh, is about some of the battles that we're fighting in Congress as it relates to Internet freedom, because as much as we take it for granted, it's not a guarantee. Uh, one of the things my studies taught me is that the Internet was designed by engineers, and it's governed by a complex web of stakeholders. You've got groups like ICANN, uh, the Internet Engineering Task Force, and there's an open means, uh, like the request for comment process, uh, that allows you to govern the Internet uh, in a way uh, that the government uh, can't control it exclusively. It's something that's actually opened up to a wide range of stakeholders, and that's allowed it to be successful. And so if government starts to try to ignore that multi-stakeholder process, as well as the engineering that goes with it, uh, then some very dangerous things can start happening. And, you know, if you look at some of the old world technologies that, uh, that have been proposed to apply to the Internet, uh, those kind of, of new technologies are truly a threat to Internet freedom. I think that's at the heart of, of what a lot of us have been concerned about. So uh, my message is simple. It's that if you prize Internet freedom, don't let the government break the Internet. And, you know, one of the things that, uh, you know, we look at in Congress, but also the whole country, uh, looked at was what was happening at the World Conference on International Telecommunications in Dubai. And, uh, you know, you don't see a lot of bipartisanship in Congress. You hear about all the, you know, the, the vitriol and the, the battles and everything's partisan and Congress can't come together and do things. Uh, but Congress actually did on this issue. This was one of those rare issues uh, where Congress came together, Republicans and Democrats, House and the Senate. Uh, this issue brought us together uh, to oppose what was getting ready to happen in Dubai and, and to stand up for Internet freedom. And so I, I, don't, I don't think that can be understated uh, just how important that was. Uh, because fighting attempts by those who want the United Nations International Telecommunications Union to wade into governance of the Internet was, in fact, something that we passed legislation uh, to prevent. And that legislation uh, was something that we were able to present our delegation with when they went to Dubai. And, uh, and I want to thank Commissioner McDowell. He was one of those who went to Dubai. I'm not sure if anybody else in this room was there, but uh, I want to thank uh, Commissioner McDowell personally for the work he does, not only on Internet freedom, but the fact that he was one of the ones who went to Dubai uh, to represent the United States and, and present the concept that, uh, that we're opposed uh, to any kind of, of outside interference with that multi-stakeholder governance. So I want to thank you, Commissioner, for... for doing that, because you, you can't understate exactly how important that was that, that the United States went on record. Uh, but the ITU's expertise is the traditional telephone line. In fact, it goes back to the telegraph, and, and those are not the same kind of rules that we want to apply uh, to the Internet. Uh, I'm proud of Congress's commitment to Internet freedom on the global stage and for our delegation's refusal to, to sign the new ITU charter as a reference to Internet policies uh, that was included. During the next year, I'm hopeful that we can build on the bipartisan efforts and continue to tell the world that efforts to expand ITU authority to the Internet for what likely would lead to censorship by oppressive countries like China and Russia, who have been pushing this, will impede innovation and economic growth everywhere. That's why this is so important to us in the United States. Internet freedom is just too important to let transnational regimes manage and little by little start breaking that freedom. Perhaps more importantly, I think we need to show the world that Internet freedom is a priority. And that means taking a look at our domestic policies through the lens of Internet freedom that our delegation in Dubai championed. That means eliminating outdated regulations and rejecting new ones that muddle the message. In an increasingly all IP world, we must get our tech and telecom policies right to ensure a vibrant Internet and the limitless innovation and unbridled economic growth that goes along with it. And just look at cybersecurity debates that we're having in Congress. And, and this is something that we're going to be debating in the next two years. 
Uh, in Dubai, we saw Russia and China try and expand ITU jurisdiction into the cybersecurity doma domain, uh, which would have placed an international bureaucratic behemoth right in the middle of serious threats that require flexible and extremely dynamic responses. America opposed those efforts, recognizing that cybersecurity was just a stalking horse for government control. Similarly, we should cast a skeptical eye on domestic policies that would put the government front and center over the methods many of you use to protect your private networks. Legislation usurping the collaborative efforts of private industry, security experts, and academia is bad enough, but a unilateral executive order is even worse. So I call on President Obama and his whole administration to disavow any attempts to bypass the checks and balances of Congress when we're addressing these issues. Instead, we should recognize that Internet freedom demands that the government facilitate private cybersecurity efforts in the multi-stakeholder process and not try to replace it. In 2008, when the conficker worm spread to millions of computers globally, it was not a governmental task force that fixed it, but instead it was a group of volunteer experts who became known as the conficker working group that actually took that on. Uh, similarly, no politician recognized the security flaws in the domain name system, and no bureaucrat devised a solution, which today we know as DNSSEC. Instead, it was one man, Dan Kaminsky, who figured it out, as well as hundreds of individuals that have worked every day to make it a reality. These are just a few examples of the multi-stakeholder process at work and the kind of innovation that we should be facilitating on the government side. They must be calling from China to slow us down here. <laughs> But how can we facilitate that? How can we do this? Uh, incentivizing in in information sharing is one of the obvious ways. And I hope the 113th Congress will build on the efforts taken by the 112th. But let's talk about another important area that Congress is looking at, and that is privacy. The United States fought hard in Dubai against several proposals specifically designed to remove the notion of privacy from the Internet. For example, we were able to beat back an attempt to include provisions in the treaty that would have member nations promote more what was called secure online identity control, which is basically treaty speak for the elimination of online anonymity. Now, if you can imagine if citizens in countries like Egypt, Tunisia, and Yemen did not have the freedom and the anonymity to unite through the use of social media sites such as Twitter and Facebook to overthrow their oppressive, tyrannical governments, uh, what would have then been the option for them if that was taken away. Unfortunately, we were not as successful in preventing the adoption of an article on the control of spam. Now, it might seem that this would be a good thing, because who's for more spam? Uh, however, the question isn't the what, but the who. And as we see in the legislative process, the devil is always in the details, because the spam control proposals tacitly acknowledged that the, in the name of controlling spam, it's okay for the nations of the world to read the contents of citizens' emails and messages. Again, you can see how dangerous uh, that would be if governments started going down that road uh, and had treaty ability to do it. These privacy proposals have the potential to reduce the freedom to speak your mind that has made the internet a catalyst for social discourse and change around the world. But worse than that, it validates and justifies the actions of some of the more oppressive political regimes on the planet. And we saw those regimes pushing for these kind of changes, which should be telling to all of us. As we continue to be the beacon of freedom and open discourse and commerce to the world, we cannot afford to weaken the Internet's ability to provide the powerless a safe avenue to speak out against injustice. As Congress considers debating its own privacy legislation, we must keep Internet freedom close to our heart. That means always asking, what are we losing if proposals come forward? Not only what are we trying to achieve, but what would that, that legislation or proposal take away in terms of the freedoms we currently enjoy? That means always remembering that startups are staffed by entrepreneurs and engineers, not compliance officers and attorneys. That means understanding that mom and pop operations are not just brick and mortar, but they're web and blog based nowadays. That means recognizing the many strides that industry and nonprofits have already made to protect user privacy. All of this means I'm highly skeptical that legislative and regulatory efforts to curb the collection and use of browsing activity can be accomplished without impeding consumer access to information on the web. 
I caution my colleagues in Congress, the NTIA and the FTC, to tread carefully as we're dealing with these sensitive issues. And if we do move forward in Congress, we should tread lightly and focus first on narrowly defined data security disclosure rules that respect the Internet ecosystem. Lastly, we saw the European Telecom Network Operators Association push to impose the econo economic legacy regulations of the telephone world onto the Internet by requiring the ITU to administer a governmental system that allows foreign telcos to charge websites for Internet traffic. That's like charging car manufacturers for the highway maintenance of the people who drive their cars uh, because somebody's driving on a road. And I think most of us would agree that would be an absurd idea, yet that's what this proposal looks like. Uh, so it's not dead. It, it might not be in place today, but France is still pushing for this kind of radical proposal. Advocates of Internet freedom across the entire ecosystem cannot rest. Efforts are still afoot to extend other legacy regulations to the Internet world and strip the freedom of private companies competing in a competitive marketplace to modernize new investments. When there isn't market failure, the government should just stay away. These efforts to regulate important stakeholders across the entire Internet ecosystem should be viewed as attacks on Internet freedom at large. Even if the government picks winners and losers in the fiscal market, an unfortunate truth, we should hold the Internet to a higher standard. An infringement on anyone's Internet freedom just foreshadows an attack on everyone's, and the Internet is just too important to go down that slippery slope. In an increasingly IP world, Internet stakeholders are not just the telcos or the big dot coms, but the startups, the app developers, the smartphone manufacturers, the community bloggers, the independent journalists, the families that connect without wires, and the individual that has forged friendships online. As this IP transition continues to explode, Congress and the FCC should not only resist the temptation to pile on new regulations, but should exercise humility by clearing the regulatory underbrush of a bygone error of competition and technology. Uh, the new rules, the old rules don't apply to this new technology. This is especially true for tra traditional voice and video providers who now compete across platforms and even with unregulated edge providers. Our response to this newly converged marketplace should not be to level the playing field by extending legacy regulations to new entries and technologies, but rather to let the Internet work and repeal the archaic and obsolete rules that are now on the books. Uh, you know, somebody who's been in this industry uh, for a long time and seen it change dramatically, uh, one of the things that I've said is that I think the reason that the Internet has flourished so much over the years is because government hasn't figured out a way to regulate it. You know, and there's something to be said for uh, an industry that's moved so fast and luckily faster than the speed of government's ability to slow it down. And we, we sure don't want to see that, that change. So the multi-stakeholder multi process, which has served the Internet and the entire technology industry so well, should be heralded uh, not only uh, as a success on the global stage, but also back here at home. So when we're going to Dubai and saying uh, this is important to protect Internet freedom, we also need to remember it uh, when we're making policy here in the United States. We should let all, we should, we should let internet freedom as it was expressed by the U.S. delegation in Dubai uh, be our policy compass throughout the 113th Congress. Uh, so I know we'll continue to talk and have this conversation as we move forward, as we see proposals be brought forward, uh, but as we do, we all need to work together to make sure that we're fighting to keep that internet freedom in place that has allowed the technology industry to be one of the great bright spots in a struggling economy. So uh, it's an honor to be with you. Uh, thank you for the work that all of you do in the technology industry. And again, I thank you for, for having me with you today.